guys, it's Caitlin. Today I'm going to be doing a highly anticipated video, which is my Q&A video. You guys sent me some awesome questions for this video. I asked you to send me any questions that you had on writing, querying, personal questions, books and movies that I love, just any questions that you had in general, and I got so many great questions. So I have them over here on my laptop listed out. I'm going to include the questioner and their social media. You can go and check out their pages and Twitter and Facebook profiles as well. Most of them are writers or book lovers themselves, so definitely go check them out when you finish watching the video. So there are 13 questions, so this video is going to be a little long. I will try to keep it under 20 minutes, but I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. Alrighty, let's jump into it. The first question is from Kayla Johansson at kjohansson7, and she asks, what's one maybe unexpected thing you've learned since you started querying? So there's two things that I want to talk about in this question and the first thing is that your first book might not be the one and by that I mean that it might not be the first book that you write or query that ends up receiving agent representation or that picks up a publisher because even some writers who snag an agent and get representation they don't sell that first book um, that their agent had signed them for and they end up having to write more projects that ultimately get signed to a publisher but when you're querying it might not be that book, especially if it's the first book you've ever written, that receives an offer of representation from an agent. And so I think that while you want to definitely have faith in your work and be really confident in yourself whenever you're querying, you also want to come in with really realistic expectations and just saying that, hey, you know, it might take my second or fifth or tenth manuscript before I finally get an agent. And definitely you don't want to give up. You want to keep editing and querying until you completely run out of agents to query, but a lot of times there comes a point where you have to realize that there might be something that just doesn't work in that manuscript and it might be time to move on. So um, going into querying, be confident, but also just set up realistic expectations for yourself so that you're not setting yourself up to be disappointed in the end. Alright, so the second thing that I want to mention is that agents are not scary. Whenever I started querying, I was very, very young and I kind of put agents up on a pedestal above me in such a way that I started to believe that they were really scary and that querying them was just a really frightening process when in fact agents are just people just like us. They're just book lovers who love literature and want to find a work that they're passionate about. They want to be on your side, they want to be on your team, and they want to support writers, even debut writers. Whenever you're going into querying, you obviously want to be respectful and professional, but also keep in mind that it's okay to connect with agents on social media, to reach out with them, to try to have conversations with them, because they are real people as well. And so whenever I went into querying, that was something that I had an image of them that I had that now after all these years of querying I've kind of broken myself out of. I've talked to a lot of agents on social media and gotten to know them whether that be from you know my blog or just talking one on one or from feedback that I've gotten from queries that I've sent and they're amazingly nice people and they just want to support you and support great books so don't be afraid of them and don't be afraid to reach out to them even before you start querying. All right, next is from Joy C at Fullness of Joy 16. She asked me three questions. So her first question is, what books are you currently reading and are there any special standouts from this year? The book that I am currently reading is King's Cage by Victoria Aveyard and I am loving this book. I love the Red Queen series. I'm about, let's see, my bookmark's in here. I'm only on page 74. Um, as I mentioned in my Voices of YA tag video, I read really slowly, and so not by choice, by the way. I would love to read a book a day if I could, but it's just not realistic for me. So I do read kind of slowly, um, but this is my current read right now, and there's going to be some more releases in the Red Queen series next year, so I'm really, really looking forward to that. And I just love Victoria's writing and the plot and just this whole series and the premise for it. She took superpowers and she made it totally unique and fresh, and I really love that. So I definitely am enjoying this this book. I have only read one other book this year and that was Caraval by Stephanie Garber and I was about halfway through a second book which I ultimately did not finish. So it's really really bad because it's June now and so we're halfway through the year and I've only read one book 
which I wish I could read way more than that and hopefully I will be able to read quite a few more books before the end of the year because I'm starting to really prioritize reading and make that a priority again in my life. So hopefully I'll be able to read more books before the end of the year but I can't really say if there's any special standouts from this year just because I haven't read that many books. So I'm sorry Joy, I can't give you any more books that were standouts from this year. I just haven't read that many books to choose from, but hopefully I'll be able to give y'all some really great recommendations going forward as I read some more books before the end of this year. The second question is, what genres do you most love to write in? And that would be young adult science fiction and fantasy. Those are the two genres that I write in and for right now, I only write in young adult. I do write some picture books, but that's a little more sporadic, and um, that is another passion of mine. But for now, I'm pursuing publication for my young adult book, What Lies Above, and that is a young adult science fiction fantasy novel. Um, it leans more towards sci-fi, but it's not like really hardcore science fiction. Um, it's a little bit lighter. It just deals with some more advanced technology in a fantasy-esque kind of world. So it kind of straddles both of those genres. But science fiction and fantasy are my two favorite genres to write in as well as to read in. Joy's third question is, what is your favorite film from this year? So we don't go to the theater very much because we live in a really small town and there's only like two movies ever playing at the theater at one time. So um, we tend to rent movies, but there are a few movies that I have seen this year that I want to mention that I thought were really good. The first one was Hidden Figures, which is a movie about three African-American women who worked in the NASA program whenever they were trying to launch the space program. And so that was a really great movie. It was really inspiring, it was funny, it was motivational, and it was based on a true story, which I really love movies that are based on a true story. So that was a really great movie. The second movie was Lion, which was recommended by Amy at A Magical World of Words. So thank you, Amy, for mentioning that one on your blog. I really enjoyed that movie. It is also a based on a true story movie and it's about an Indian boy who gets lost in India and separated from his family and is adopted by an Australian couple and later on in his life, like somewhere in his 30s I think, he tries to find his family again and it has like documentary and footage towards the end from real life events of him trying to search for his family and it was just really heartwarming. There wasn't a lot of like action in it um, so if you're looking for an action movie, that's probably not your best bet, but I really, really enjoyed it and I thought that was a really great movie. And third and finally was The Fault in Our Stars, which I loved so much, and I put this on Twitter whenever I finished watching it, how many feelings that I had after watching that movie. It was sad, it was emotional, it pulls at your heartstrings in all the best ways, and I watched it with my brother and even he was really into it, which was surprising because it's like a romance young adult movie adaptation, and so I was pleasantly surprised about him liking it so much, but I absolutely loved it, and it was just so cute and so, so heartwarming, and it was sad, and I almost cried, but I still loved that movie. There were some parts in it that were a little inappropriate, so, you know, you might want to need to fast forward over those, but other than that, I love that movie so, so much, and I'm definitely going to be picking up the book now. It's in my TBR, so I kind of did it in reverse. I watched the movie before I read the book, which I don't typically do, but it was on TV and I really wanted to see it, and I'm so glad that I watched it because it was really, really amazing. The next questions come from Rose Erickson at R.O. Hearts Writing. And she asked two questions. She said, do you have a writing routine or schedule, and if so, what is it? So. I'm so ashamed to say this, but I don't have a writing schedule as of right now just because it is the summer and every day kind of fluctuates based on what I'm doing. I have different priorities each day and different places to go. And even if I'm just at home, I have different um, activities or different plans for each day of what I want to accomplish. So it varies. I don't have like a set schedule each day. And because of that, I don't have a set writing schedule each day. Um, I don't write every day right now. I, I write a few times a week and I write kind of in sprints. So I'll write lots of words all at one time, but we've been doing some traveling and I've been having a lot of stuff on my plate. So for right now, my writing is kind of sporadic, but whenever school starts again in the fall, I will definitely have a writing schedule. I'm a planner and I like to have calendars and lists and everything to be organized and planned out by hour. And so I will definitely have a writing routine slash schedule in the fall because I will plan out every single day and there will be a slot for every single activity 
in order to get the most done, in order to maximize my time because I'll have work and school and writing and blogging and social media and events. And so, yes, I will have a writing schedule starting in the fall, but right now I do not have a very strict one. It kind of just fluctuates from day to day. Rose's second question is, how do you handle rejection, especially from agents? So whenever I started querying, again, I was really young and it was very difficult. I would cry every time I got a rejection almost. But over time, you kind of develop a tougher skin and you learn that rejection is just part of writing. In the beginning, I thought that my book was awful and I was a terrible writer because I just didn't understand how the publishing world worked. So I thought that it was relatively easy to get a book published, um, but over time I've learned that that's not the case. It's, it's difficult to get a book published and it's difficult to be a writer. And so I've learned that rejection doesn't mean that you're a bad writer and it doesn't mean that your book is bad or the writing is bad. It just means that that wasn't right for that agent or in some cases, yes, your book might need to be edited and revised or sometimes set aside and you have to work on a new project, but it does not mean that you should just give up on your dream and start to think that writing is not for you because so, so many great writers have been rejected. Um, J.K. Rowling was rejected a bunch of times. Um, I've heard Stephanie Garber say that before she got Caraval published, she had to write quite a few manuscripts and even Caraval was rejected again and again and again before she found somebody to pick it up and represent it and pitch it to publishers. So it doesn't mean that you're writing or that you as a writer are bad. One thing that helps me to deal with rejection other than just reminding myself that rejection doesn't define me and doesn't define my writing is to focus on the positive. I've had so many people say so many encouraging and positive things to me about my writing and about what lies above and just really great encouragement. And Kristen Kiefer actually recommended a great way to keep the negativity at bay and that is to make an encouragement jar which is where she has printed off a bunch of encouraging notes or emails or comments that she's gotten on social media, her blog, email, and just any place that people have been able to talk to her. And she's printed them out and cut them out and put them in a little jar. And anytime she's feeling really negative about herself or her writing, she will dump out the jar and go through those little comments and they help her to really get motivated again and stay positive and realize that even though someone might make a really negative comment or you might be trying to convince yourself that you're a bad writer, that there's other people who believe in you, and that there is a positive side to everything, even if you are kind of only seeing the negative side for whatever reason. And so I think that's a really great way to stay positive and to keep that discouragement away. Um, we all feel discouraged and we all feel really low sometimes about our writing and ourselves, but we just have to keep writing and just have to keep pushing forward and staying positive about it. So surround yourself with really great writing friends and non-writing friends, people who will encourage you, motivate you, and be on your side even whenever you're feeling really, really low and really discouraged. Find those people who will help you to stay positive. Next is Timothy Schrock at Timothy underscore Schrock. And he asked or said, my brother says that I should add more romance to my fantasy, should I? So this is a really interesting question because it's kind of asking for my advice, which is so sweet and I love, but also because it is asking for my advice, it's going to be very subjective and other people will probably have different opinions on this. So I would say that it depends on your story and on your characters and their character arcs. If a love interest will help them or help the story and strengthen it in some way, by all means, definitely a romantic subplot is totally appropriate. However, if romance is put in just for the sake of having romance or just for the sake of having like this subplot that really doesn't mean anything, then I would say don't force it because it will come across very forced. And sometimes romance in YA can be very forced because the love interest really has no purpose other than just to be there for the sake of that romance. Give that love interest goals and personality, make them three-dimensional, and make them a part of the story. They need to be doing something. If they just show up in romantic scenes and then disappear and you're kind of wondering where they're at, that can be a huge red flag that the romance is not necessary and that that love interest is just kind of like an extraneous character who doesn't really need to be there. So if you think that your character could benefit from having a romance or a love interest, then definitely I would recommend that it would be great to have that in there, but if not, just leave it out. Don't try to force it and just stick to the story that you want to tell. Next is Nicole at Who Picked This Book? And she asked three questions. She said, what author have you read the most from? All right, and that would be Margaret Peterson Haddix, which I have all of her books 
right here, and these are all the books that I own from her. I have read quite a few other novels by her that I got from the library that I do not own, but these are the books that I do own from her, so there are quite a few. And this stack is actually comprised of several different series, so I'm going to just kind of go through them real quickly and tell you what books I do own from her, because there are quite a few. So I will start with this standalone, which is The Always War, and, um, here, let me hold it on this side. <laughs> and this is a standalone book. This is the only standalone book that I own from her. I have read quite a few standalones, but again, I got this from the library, so I do not own those. And I read this book a very long time ago, and I don't really remember what it's about, but I do think that I enjoyed it, but I can't really say very much about the plot or anything because I don't really remember very much about it. I do think the cover is pretty cool, if you can see that. It's really pretty cover, but I don't remember very much about the plot. So that's the standalone that I own from her, The Always War. Alright, the first series that I have from Margaret Pearson Haddix is the Missing series, and this is, well there's one book before this which is found, but I lent it out to somebody, and then we moved and I never got it back, and I'm not sure where it is, but um, I have the second through the fifth books, which are Sent, Sabotage, Torn, and Caught, and then there are I think like three or four books after this to finish up the series that I never read. I read these um, quite a long time ago, whenever I was in middle school. They are time travel books, and each one takes place in a different historical time period. So one book takes place on the Mayflower and in the first colonies. Another book takes place in like the Victorian era, medieval era. So they're just really cool, really unique books, and if you're into time travel, then this is definitely a good series to check out. The next series that I have from her is the Shadow Children series, which I think has seven books. Yeah, seven books in it, and these are quite small books. <laughs> they are really fast reads. They're really, really good. The premise for this book is really unique, and it's going to be making an appearance in the Unique Premises video, which I will be doing in the next couple of weeks. The society in which these books takes place is kind of like an alternate reality of a dystopian America, and I don't know if they ever actually mention in here that it does take place in America. I think at one point Margaret Peterson Haddix said that she purposefully did not set them in America, but that it's supposed to be kind of like an alternate reality of what our world might be like one day. And the population has grown so much that the government can no longer support all of the people, and therefore each family and each couple is only allowed to have two children. And the main character in this series, Luke, is a third child, so he has to spend all of his life in hiding, and it's just about them finding freedom and being allowed to live, and it's really amazing. Some of the books are narrated by different characters, but Luke is the main character and he narrates most of the books in the series. This was recommended to me by my librarian in elementary school, so I started reading these books in like fifth grade, I think, and I love them, love them. I actually have two copies of Among the Hidden, which is the first book in this series, so if you would be interested in me doing a giveaway for this, I would absolutely love to share this copy with you. Just let me know in the comments below. I'd love to do a giveaway for you guys. So those are all my Margaret Peterson Haddix books that I own. She has written so many books and she produces so much quality material every year. It's incredible. So she would be the author that I have read the most of and own the most books for on my bookshelf. Nicole's second question is what genre have you read the most from? And that would be young adult slash middle grade fantasy. I say middle grade included as well because I have quite a few middle grade books on my bookcase and I've kept them from whenever I read them in elementary school and middle school. So I love to keep books from whenever I was a younger reader. So I have a lot of middle grade books and most of them are fantasy and then most of my young adult books are fantasy as well. So fantasy is my favorite genre. I do like science fiction too but most of the books that I own are fantasy. Nicole's third question is coffee, tea, or wine? Well, I can knock out wine because I don't drink wine, but um, coffee and tea, I really don't like tea that much. I like iced tea or sweet tea or flavored teas like that, but I do not like hot tea very much. So definitely hands down, coffee would be my favorite from the three of those. Again, I don't drink coffee that much, but I do really, really love it. And I like iced coffee better than hot coffee. So I can drink iced coffee all day long. And so coffee would definitely be my favorite. Next is from Audrey Kalin, who blogs at Audrey Kalin Journey of an Aspiring Indie Author. 
and she is one of my good writer friends so definitely go check out her blog and she asked what inspired your novel What Lies Above. So if you don't know What Lies Above is the second book that I wrote and the book that I am currently querying. It is a young adult science fiction fantasy novel and I think I mentioned a little early in the video it kind of leans a little more towards science fiction. It has some advanced technology and I originally got the concept for What Lies Above actually back in high school whenever I was still drafting Concealed. I got the idea for this book from a high school science textbook and it was talking about global warming. The Lies Above has nothing to do with global warming so if you eventually one day hopefully read it and you're like how does global warming have to do anything with this? It doesn't but the way in which they were talking about it got me thinking about how most books take place in like a post-apocalyptic sun-scorched world where everything is dry and deserted and I really wanted to have a different kind of setting in a young adult book. Originally What Lies Above was a dystopia so that's why I was thinking about a post-apocalyptic world but as I started to flesh out the story and the characters more I wanted it to be set in a science fiction fantasy world so I changed it and created a whole universe and everything for the book but originally it was a dystopia so I started to consider what it would be like if maybe there was a different kind of weather phenomena for the future instead of of sun flares or sun scorching or disease. Once I got that original concept I started thinking about the characters living in the world and what their stories were and their motivations and it kind of just all built and expanded from there until I had the whole story arc for What Lies Above and eventually the finished product. I get ideas from everywhere, songs, textbooks, regular books, listening to people's conversations, the television, so I really recommend you to just keep your eyes open and your ears open and listen because sometimes I'll be having a conversation with somebody and I'll say something and then I'll be like, wow, that would be a really good idea for a book and I'll write it down real quick and then later on when I'm at home or when I go to my room, I'll kind of flush it out and start thinking about some arcs and sub arcs for the characters and plots and subplots for the story of how I could use that idea in something I've already started writing or in a future idea. So just keep your eyes and ears open because you never know where ideas can come from. Sometimes it is in the craziest places like a textbook. All right, the last two questions come from Amy Nikita Wannenberg. She blogs at A Magical World of Words, and I mentioned her earlier, she is the one who recommended that I watch Lion. We have done so many things together. She is one of my best writer friends and blogger friends. We've buddy read Caravelle together. We've had several guest posts on each other's blogs and swaps. She was my first Swap It Saturday guest, so we've just done a lot of things together. She does book and movie reviews, so I do writing advice and she does reviews, so that's something a little different if you're looking for some good book or movie recommendations. I highly recommend you go check her site out. She asked two questions. The first one is, do you cast your characters when you write, set them to famous faces, etc.? And I do not do this. Um, I picture my characters really well in my head of what I want them to look like. So for me, assigning like a celebrity face to them really isn't very practical. I don't um, need to do that. I know a lot of people make like Pinterest aesthetics or collages or things and they'll give some pictures to kind of represent their character and sometimes I will go and scroll through images not necessarily of celebrities but just like any people in general that I can find on the internet to kind of get physical appearance ideas but I do not assign like a certain celebrity to a character or try to cast them as if they were in a movie or anything like that. If any of my books ever became movies one day, I would probably not have anything to do with the casting part. I might have like a little, you know, part in some opinions of, oh, you know, this person's blonde and they're supposed to be brown headed or whatever. But other than that, that's not really my expertise. So I don't cast anybody for my characters. I just kind of think about them in the way that I imagined them whenever I first started writing. Also for me, I know that with like movie adaptations, once a celebrity has been assigned to a book character that I've already read in a trilogy or series, I kind of forget what I imagine that character like in the beginning. So for me, if I assigned a celebrity to my characters, it would probably kind of get in the way of me imagining them in my head the way that I originally did. And the last question is, what's your favorite movie and why? So I mentioned earlier some movies that I liked from this year, but those were not my favorite movies of all time. Those were just some favorites from 2017. So I will share now some of my top favorite movies of all time. And I have quite a few depending on my mood. If I'm in like a romantic comedy, lighthearted kind of movie mood, then I will watch Pride and Prejudice, the Keira Knightley version, Leap Year, or Letters to Juliet. Those three movies I really love, and they're kind of more modern, contemporary. Pride and Prejudice is obviously um, a period drama, but 
it's still more contemporary. It's not like a fantasy movie or anything like that. And they're more romantic movies and some of them are more comedies. And those three movies are usually my top options to watch. If I'm looking for something a little bit more action-packed and like fantasy-esque, then I will watch Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. And Lord of the Rings is my top tied for number one spot movie. And you'll see the other top number one pick. Um, I'm going to mention that in a minute, but that is one of my favorite movies. I love the Lord of the Rings series. The cinematics are amazing, the story is amazing, and there's some really amazing characters in the movie. So I definitely love, love, love that movie series. If I'm in more of like a young adult movie adaptation, action movie kind of mood, you know, a story with some younger characters. Then I will watch The Hunger Games, which is tied for my top number one favorite movie. It's my favorite series, and I think that the movie adaptation was done really, really well. And again, Lord of the Rings and Hunger Games are my top two favorite movies, so I tend to watch those over and over and over again, and I never get tired of them. I love them more and more every time that I watch them. All right, so that is all the questions that you guys asked. If you would be interested in me doing another Q&A video in the future, just comment down below and let me know if you enjoyed this video and if you would like to see a Q&A video again in the future. If you didn't get a chance to ask me some questions, then definitely let me know and I would love to do another video in the future and allow you guys to ask me more questions or some new people who didn't get a chance to ask me some different questions in the future as well. I also want you guys to vote below in the comments on what video you want to see next. Would you rather see a unique premises video or books with the most mind-blowing plot twists? So plot twists or unique premises. I'm going to be doing both of those in the future and I would love to know which video you guys would like to see next. So comment below and let me know about that. And again, if you would be interested in winning a copy of the first book in the Shadow Children series, Among the Hidden, let me know down below in the comments and I would love to do a giveaway. I hope you enjoyed all these questions and kind of seeing an inside look into my writing and querying journey and seeing some of my favorite books and movies. Thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to comment below about those three things I mentioned. The giveaway, what video you want to see next, and if you would want to see a Q&A video in the future.